we get started with our last session, um, I know we've enjoyed spending Saturday together, but you probably have some things you'd like to get on to. Uh, but I'm really excited to introduce our final speaker to you today. Uh, this is Gina Cho. Gina received her JD from uh, SUNY Buffalo School of Law. Uh, she's known from a very young age that she wanted to be a lawyer uh, and made that dream come true and has worked in a variety of settings, uh, uh, working in the district attorney's office, uh, and now is doing bankruptcy work and has her own practice. Um, but that's not what we brought uh, Gina here to talk to you about. Um, Gina has become uh, quite an expert on mindfulness, on um, working, having a virtual law office. She is in the process of writing a book for the ABA called The Anxious Lawyer. She has written many, many articles, is a frequent speaker, uh, and I just think has a really great perspective on um, how, how to make sure you don't lose yourself in your law practice. Uh, and so I've asked her to come and chat with all of us today to make sure that as you leave and you engage in your practice, that we find the joy in our work and uh, make some time for ourselves and make sure that we bring our best selves to that work to serve our clients and to serve us. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gina. Thank Great, you. thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Great. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to invite everyone to just, hit, let's take a pause. Um, so place both feet on the ground and just check in with your body, see how you're feeling. And let's just take three breaths together. So breathing in, Breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, and more breathing in, and breathing out. So um, when Susanna asked me to come and speak to you guys about having a joyful Career, I thought, wow, what a huge responsibility to give you guys all the tips about having a joyful law career in half hour, right? Um, so I'm going to try and do that, and I think, um, you know, and I really kind of struggled with this, and I said, you know, what can I say in a half hour that will be meaningful, that people can take away, um, that will really help people in their practice? And what I thought would be most helpful is to share my own journey with you. So when I first started practicing law, 11 years ago, this idea of joy was non-existent. Um, you know, it was always like, do more, achieve, um, be successful, don't be a failure, you know, all these sort of expectations. Um, and you know, in many ways, that actually propelled me forward and got me to where I am today. Um, but in many ways, I sort of lost myself and um, lost touch with the things that were really important to me. So to kind of go back a little bit, um, my parents and I immigrated to this country back in 1988. I was 10 years old. And when you're an immigrant um, in the US and you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture, you don't know the legal system, um, you get taken advantage of a lot. And growing up, I watched a lot of Law & Order. Like I used to just sit there and watch it like hours and hours and hours. And I thought, oh, I want to be a prosecutor so that I can correct all the injustices of the world. And I really wanted to make a difference. And I really had this calling, like if I became a prosecutor, that it would give meaning to my life and it would really give meaning to you know, my parents' suffering and just all the hardships that we experienced. Um, so I went to University of Buffalo. Um, I went to law school there. And then I promptly failed the bar exam after graduation. And that was the first time in my life where I really experienced failure. And I thought, oh my gosh, until that point, um, I never re realized that I can really apply myself and try really hard at something and fail. You know, my parents always told me, you know, do good work, apply yourself, and you'll succeed. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I actually failed at something. Um, but now I recognize that it wasn't a failure. Um, so, you know, I'd like for all of us to kind of redefine this idea of a failure. I think a lot of us sort of live so in fear of avoiding failure that we fail to take risks in life and really find that joy and pleasure and you know being creative. Um, so I moved to Tampa, Florida. I passed the Florida bar and I became an assistant state attorney. And you know I got my first caseload and I was just so excited. Um, and then I quickly realized the work that I would be doing wasn't aligned with my values. Um, you know, a bulk of my cases were actually spent prosecuting 
undocumented immigrants who were caught driving without a valid license. And I thought, oh, like I can't, I can't do this work, right? Okay? Because you know it was just so inconsistent with who I was as a person and the work that I believed in doing. Um, but despite that, you know, I stuck it out, right? Because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and at some point, I just decided, you know, it really wasn't working. Like every Sunday night. I would start to get stomach aches. Um, so that's a clear sign. If you start to get stomach aches on Sunday nights at, and because of the dread of going to work on Monday, uh, maybe it's a sign that you should start tuning in and listening to your body. Um, so I decided to move out to San Francisco. I thought you know, I would be able to find more people that are like me, find my tribe. So I moved out here, and that was in 2006 and 2007, and I thought, you know, I don't know if I really want to do the law thing anymore. And so I started a little export company um, exporting wine to Korea. I still had relatives there, and they were buying wine from me. Um, and then the 2008-2009, you know, the market crash, and there was no more exporting of wine. Um, so I started doing some volunteer work with the AIDS Legal Referral Panel. And one of the cases that I was assigned to was this immigrant, and he um, you know, he had difficulty with English language, and he, not in addition to having AIDS, he suffered from um, a bipolar disorder. So when he was on his high, he would go out and spend you know, a lot of money on his credit card, and then when he was on his low, he would just berate himself about his debt. And he came into my office, and he just cried, and he cried and cried and cried, and, and, I, and I looked at him, and I thought, I can help you. There's something I can actually do to help you. So I got him through bankruptcy, and three months later, he was debt-free. And I just remember he hugged me and he cried, and I thought, oh, right, this is why I became a lawyer. Like, it really, really gave meaning to my life. So my husband, who's also a lawyer, quit his job. I quit my job. We both started our law practice together back in 2009. We were still boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. We weren't married. And about two years into our practice, um, things were going amazingly well. Like we were meeting all of our financial expectations. We had more clients than we knew what to do with. Our practice was just booming. But despite that, I was constantly suffering from insomnia, headaches, backaches, and I just thought, well, you know, it's just part of the, you know, this like suffering is just part of the job description. Um, and I would just sort of like medicate my way through it. So you know, I was, I was taking painkillers and um, sleeping pills. And then I started losing hair. Um, and I don't mean just like a little bit of hair, like you know, you see in the shower drain. I was actually losing clumps of hair. So I went to a doctor, he ran like every test, and he goes, Gina, there's nothing wrong with you. I think this is all in your head. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm perfectly fine, I'm totally happy. Um, and a good friend of mine who's a psychotherapist suggested that I take this class called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. Has anyone ever heard of the MBSR program and John Kabat-Zinn? Yeah, completely amazing. Um, I signed up for it at Stanford, and I thought, well, if they're teaching it to medical students and these Stanford graduates, and they're teaching it at Stanford, like how woo-woo can it be, right? And what I realized through that class was that what I was really missing was the sense of joy. Like I never thought that joy was an important part of my life. But you know, when you pause and reflect for a moment, you know, we're like on this earth for the very short period of time, and like, what's really the thing that were meant to do, and it really got me to really reflect on my life and consider things that I never asked before. I mean, before it was just more like, you know, earn a lot of money, you know, do good work, become successful, but I, and I sort of led an unexamined life. Um, so the five things that I'd like to share with you that um, I found to be helpful in cultivating joy um, are these. So the first thing I would say is to start listening to yourself. Um, and you know, there's this poem by Rumi, and he says, keep looking at the bandaged place. That's where the light enters you. So when I say to start listening to yourself, I don't mean just listening to the good things or the positive things, but also listening to the, the parts of your life that's not working, because that's the bandaged place, right? That's the place that's causing you pain. And to really look at it, to really examine it, like me losing clumps of hair, like, you know, I could have just been like, oh, denial, 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 and that's, that's not happening. But at some point, my body was saying, okay, like, you really, really, really need to pay attention because something is really not working in your life. Um, so that's the first step. 
And the second thing is to ask yourself questions. Um, and I have three questions that I would suggest that you ask yourself. And you can do these as journaling exercises, or you can just have someone sit down with you and ask these questions repeatedly over and over again. It's the looping questions. I don't know if anyone has ever done a looping question um, exercise. But the first question I would suggest you ask is, how can I be kind to myself? So, so often we spend a lot of time being incredibly harsh with ourselves, right? And once you start to tune in to how you talk to yourself, I mean, I was really surprised when I started doing this exercise because I would never speak to anyone, not my worst enemy, the way I was speaking to myself. And it's interesting because our brain, we like to categorize things, right? So we have all of these filing cabinets. And there's probably a filing cabinet in your mind somewhere that's labeled like idiot or failure. And whenever you're like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Why did I do that again? Your mind happily goes into that filing cabinet, opens it, and you have like, you know, 30 plus however many years of, you know, that category still sitting in that filing cabinet. And what we want to do is start to create new filing cabinets. And, you know, things that we like about ourselves, things that we're good at, and really start to pay attention to those. Um, and the second question I would suggest you ask is, why am I here? And so I touched on this earlier, like we're on this planet for this very brief period of time, and it's like, you know, it's kind of curious, like, why are we here? Like, what's really my mission in life? You know, what's my mission, what's my value, and what's my vision? And I think answering that question makes everything else in your life so much easier. Um, so my husband and I, just when we got married, we both sat down and we said, okay, let's make a list of 10 things that are really important to us. And we sat down and we looked at it, and we pulled that list out like once a year, like when we're reviewing our, you know, P&L or our business plan, we said, okay, are the things that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis aligning with our values? Because right? then that makes a lot of things so much simpler. Um, and then the last question I would suggest you ask is, when do I feel most alive? So, you know, when you're kind of asking questions like, what practice area should I go into? Should I do transactional work? Should I do litigation? Um, you know, I find that those questions aren't really that helpful, right? So you know, if you're just starting out, like, you don't know what that experience is going to be like. So actually paying attention to the type of clients that you enjoy working with, paying attention to what type of um, cases you enjoy, what type of classes in law school that you found to be exciting. Like, what gets you up in the morning? You know, like, what really makes you feel excited and good? Um, so, and, so I went through three th things. Um, Start listening to yourself, ask your, asking yourself questions. And the third thing is practicing non-doing. Um, so we practiced that just a little bit when, we, when I first started, just paying attention to what's going on inside, just breathing in and breathing out. Um, you know, it's interesting that in every religion across history, this act of sitting and non-doing, right? Closing your eyes and just observing what's going on inside of you exists in every single religion. And I think there's a reason for that, because in order for us to live a reflective life, we actually need time to listen. Like we're so bombarded with you know, instant messages, and Twitter, and Facebook, and emails, and it's, at the end of the day, you're just like, like I'm grasping for breath, right? So just taking a moment to listen to yourself. Um, you know, there's, it seems like you can't open or read anything without hearing that word mindfulness recently. Um, but you know, I, I really found having a daily just, and I, I call it like just checking in with myself. You know, it can be like a minute, two minutes, it doesn't have to be long, where I just sit, close my eyes, and just look inside and say, wow, like how am I feeling in this moment? Because that will give you tons of information, right? Like if I check in at 3.20 and I'm like, I'm feeling really good. I check in at four and I'm like, oh, I'm feeling really crappy. Well, what changed? That's giving you data about what makes you happy. And joy isn't something, it's not a destination, right? It's not like, oh, I've achieved joy and now I can check that off the list. It's, the, it's a constant, ongoing, um, I was gonna say struggle, but it's not really a struggle. It's, you know, it's just like kind of doing it every single day. Um, it's like finding balance, right? Like people always talk about finding balance as though it's something that 
like you know, you'll, it'll mystically appear and then you'll be able to check it off your list. But finding balance, finding peace, finding joy, it's like if you can make sure that every moment in your life is focusing in that direction of bringing you more joy, more happiness, more satisfaction, then your overall life will actually become happier. And there's so much research coming out right now about cultivating happiness and what makes people more happy. Um, if you go on Amazon, you know, just type in the word happiness. There's like 50 books that has that word happiness in it. I think there's this sort of like a cultural shift where we're really look, taking a look at you know happiness and joy, these type of sort of um, topics that we don't think we really cared about all that much. And what studies shows consistently is this. I think most of us think about happiness as like these big wins, right? Winning that big case, winning that appeal, winning the lotto. Um, but most of us have a baseline of happiness and those little sparks of happiness will you know, give you a little temporary rise, but very shortly you'll go back to your baseline. And for a long time people thought that, well, once you have that baseline, you're stuck. Like, you know, if you're always born at a one and you're always just an unhappy person, and you're kind of stuck. But it's not true. You can actually change your baseline. And the way you do this is by cultivating happiness every single day. So, you know, like when you get up in the morning, instead of just jumping out of bed and checking your email, you know, just like, wow, another day. I got to get up another morning, and what a beautiful day. Or just, you know, greeting your spouse with a little bit of loving attention instead of like, you know, why don't you pick up the dry cleaning or whatever? Or like tying your kid's shoes mindfully day after day. It's that consistent practice every single day that will actually change your baseline of happiness. Um, and the fourth tip I'd like to offer you is patience. Um, so I don't know if it's because I'm Korean, but like patience is just not my thing. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's a process, right? Um, you know, like, and I and I find just doing something like gardening or cooking to be amazing teachers of patience because you plant the seed in the ground and you can't rush that, rush that, right? Like, it has its own rhythm and momentum, and your career does too. I mean, I reflect back on the last eleven years and this crazy journey that I've taken. You know, I never thought I would be doing anything aside from being a prosecutor. And now I'm doing, I have my own practice, I'm doing you know, bankruptcy law, and I'm, I'm writing a book for the ABA. I never knew that any of those things can happen. So just, you know, it's a long stretch, right? Like your law career is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And finally, my final tip to you is finding your tribe. Um, so, you know, none of us can do this on our own. We all need to find our tribe. And certainly other lawyers make great tribes. I have, you know, some of my dearest friends are lawyers, but also finding non-lawyers, just things that you're interested in. You know, so I love cooking, I love canning, I love gardening. So finding people that are interested in it. Um, and for the women in the audience, if you join a listserv called Ladies Who Lunch, we do an annual sibling exchange, so that's amazing, right? Like finding a group of lawyers that are also interested in gardening. I mean, if you go on meetup.com, there's like literally thousands of different groups and you can go on there and find your tribe, your people, people are, that's going to sustain you, that brings you joy in your life and happiness. Um, you know, for me, it's Wisdom 2.0, which is this amazing convergence of wisdom and entrepreneurs. So, you know, that's my tribe. Um, and, you know, I consider all of you to be my tribe. So. Um, and that's all I have for um, my talk, so I really, really want to thank Suzanne for inviting me. And um, I think I have a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, yeah. You mentioned a class that the class you took from Stanford. What was mm -hmm. the name of that class again? It's called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's MBSR. And um, in San Francisco, you can take it at UCSF. And there's a few different places where you can take it. Yeah. And I think there are also just mindfulness for lawyer, for lawyer groups. Yeah, so I teach, um, so I teach a six-week mindfulness for lawyers group, um, and I have a listserv. So in your packet, there I have several listservs um, on there. So I really listservs are an amazing way to find your community, finding your tribe. Any other 
any questions? All right. Well, thank you so much.